Hello, everyone. Welcome back to St. Louis Teens, and welcome back to our series on young innovators in finance. We're here today with Chris Grant. Chris is an Opportunity Zone investor investing in distressed communities to increase economic development, and Chris is an investment manager at Blueprint Local. Chris is also at Forbes 2021 30 Under 30 in finance. Chris, we thank you so much for your service to our communities and being an inspiration to young professionals and entrepreneurs. And thank you so much for being here with us today. Yeah, of course. I mean, I was super excited to get this invitation. I mean, St. Louis is a great place. Teens are awesome. Um, you're awesome. So I really am um, excited to chat. Chris, thank you so much. I want to start off by asking, what drove you to Opportunity Zone Investing? And what is the most favorite part of your journey so far? Yeah, so to answer the question, I, I got to give you my background. So I'm originally born and raised in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, Baltimore, if you don't know, is the home of the Baltimore Ravens. Um, we also are known for our crab cakes, Obey seasoning, um, and a really nice inner harbor or waterfront area. Um, but um, growing up, I grew up in a um, really small kind of tight-knit community, and I um, went on to go and study finance and accounting at the University of Maryland College Park. So I went to the state school there. After that, I went on to um, join a firm that helped banks deal with regulatory issues. And I was a capital markets analyst first. And then after that, spent three or half, three and a half more years there um, until we got acquired by IBM. Um, so once that was over with, and after I spent so many years working in financial services and the regulatory piece of it, I decided to go to business school. Um, so I left and moved across the country to go to Stanford Business School. And what excited me and one thing that really made Stanford a really cool place for me to want to study was I wanted to understand how Silicon Valley worked and how startups and how the small venture-backed businesses were growing and scaling so quickly. Um, and during that process, it really took me back to my hometown of Baltimore because um, I used to see a ton of different businesses that um, were small, you know, and didn't really have um, big balance sheets or things like that, but they had really cool ideas. But the one thing I noticed is they weren't growing at the same space as, as pace or pace uh, as things that I saw in California. So what I want to do is figure out how could I help increase access to capital in communities that really matter to me. Um, and so that became my thesis while I was in business school. And so the Opportunity Zone program came out, um, which was going to create these different zones across the country, primarily in low and moderate income communities, and to and allow um, people to invest their dollars into those communities and gain some benefit or incentive to do so. So it seemed like a great opportunity for me to take my skills in investing back to my hometown of Baltimore, but then also be able to scale it in communities that felt similar to me. Um, so that was one thing that really drove me to Opportunity Zones. And then my favorite part of the journey so far has really been the realization that I love business, I love entrepreneurship, and I love supporting people try to turn their dreams into a reality. And the process of self-discovery along this whole journey of my life so far to get me to this point has really been the best part of the journey is all the internal work that I had to do to figure out that, wow, there's a way to connect the two. And, and Chris, can you tell us more about the specific work now that you're doing with Opportunity Zone Investing? And can you share some of the success stories so far as well? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, Opportunity Zones are um, different markets across the country that have been designated in this way. And what I get to do is I get to spend my time across what traditional investors may call the secondary or tertiary markets um, and then find really interesting investment opportunities. I focus uh, majority of my time on real estate right now um, and the opportunity zone legislation is really um, formalized in a way to create um, interesting new pro projects new developments, um, convert old abandoned warehouses and historic spaces into new modern spaces through the Opportunity Zone Investment Program. So um, basically, while I spend my time in these markets looking at different deals across the Opportunity Zone space, 
Um, I do it through my company, Blueprint Local. So Blueprint is um, a firm that was founded by my colleague, Ross Baird, um, about two years ago. And we've raised $100 million to date to support the work in our thesis. So I've been really excited that we have that one success story that investors are behind and rallying behind our idea. But in the process of Blueprint, we've raised funds and we do special purpose vehicles to make these investments. And so we have three funds across different geographic footprints. So we have a city-based fund called Blueprint Baltimore. We have a state-based fund called Blueprint Texas. And then recently we launched the Southeast Fund. So we cover the entire Southeast. So I've invested now across the Southeast um, in projects in South Carolina, North Carolina, Richmond, Virginia, and Baltimore. And, and I want to transition over now. And Chris, through my social initiative, helping those fighting homelessness start their own businesses, I'm very thankful for the mentors, the donors, and the local businesses that have supported this work. And I really wouldn't have been able to do it without their support. And Chris, you now plan to deploy $400 million to $3 billion of deployment capital across the country in the coming years. So thank you so much for your phenomenal vision and support. However, local businesses and local people are often unaware of these resources and often unaware and feel them to be inaccessible. How can more people and more businesses access these very valuable resources? I mean, you hit the nail on the head. And that was one thing that really struck me um, and led me to the Opportunity Zone program. Um, as I mentioned, growing up in Baltimore, the small neighborhood that I was in, I also went to a small church in the neighborhood where I got in contact with a lot of musical artists, some hairstylists, childcare providers, a restaurant owner, um, retail store owners, just people with all these different businesses and they were trying to make it work and they were helpful in the community. Um, but what I've noticed is that usually the ones that have had the most success have been able to do like three things really well. One, they're able to build a network um, of like a mastermind group of other people that are in their space to partner with or trade ideas with. And even if they're not in the space, just people who have the same mentality as them around entrepreneurship and building something innovative or new. The second thing is that they're active um, and they're just moving and trying to get things done. And I think that a lot of that time that activity generates some results. And then the last thing I would mention is to not quit. Um, I know even in my own experience, I tried to help a daycare center in Baltimore um, get a loan so that they could grow into a new into a new location. And through that process of talking to different banks and then community banks and then other investors, I learned about a, um, a law called the Community Reinvestment Act that says that banks have to provide loan services and investments in communities where they have a footprint. Um, so to me, that was something that has been a valuable resource for me to learn, but I wouldn't have learned it unless I got active and didn't quit to try to help that daycare center out. And Chris, you've now overseen the $140 million project to redevelop Baltimore's Amtrak and regional train station, converting it to a modern facility with new retail, restaurants, and office spaces by 2022. I do want to ask, do you require or plan to require these businesses to hire a certain percentage of local workforce or employ a certain percentage of the local workforce and prioritizing renting out to local businesses as well? Yeah, so the, the, the Amtrak project, the Baltimore Amtrak project is one that we're super excited about at Blueprint. Um, but I must say that I'm just one small little piece in this bigger puzzle of getting that redevelopment done because it's an effort that has federal associated with federal dollars and um, Amtrak associated. The state is supportive, the city is supportive, and local businesses are really supportive as well. Um, and interested in getting involved in it. So as I think about it, yes, we have um, set requirements to where we want local workforce to be involved. We want um, the businesses represented that may be tenants in terms of the retailers um, or you know, to, to have their space and be able to show their products in the train station and different things like that. So we are prioritizing the local connection um, because we think it's a local asset and we want not only um, commuters who are coming in and out of Baltimore to really enjoy it, but the people who live in the neighborhood too, to, 
to be able to come in every day and get food, get products they want, or just to hang out. And Chris, thank you so much for your work in that area. And you're now a Forbes 30 under 30 in finance for 2021. I do want to ask more of a broad question here of what inspired you to go into the field of finance and what are your personal keys to success in the field? And where do you think the future of finance is going to be 10 years from now? Yeah, so I knew I always liked business. When I was even really young, I just knew I wanted to be a businessman. And I didn't know what that meant yet, but it was important to me. Um, so when I went to college, I studied accounting because accountants have to be involved in business or connected to business since they work on their taxes, they work on their financial statements. Um, so then I realized over time that the real keys for my success, at least in finance has been being able to understand and embrace the numbers. Um, and what I mean by that is that some people are very afraid to look at numbers and to just do calculations and things like that. But I think that you should embrace it. And many times when you start looking at the numbers of something, particularly a business, it'll tell you a story and it'll tell the story about how things have been, how things are gonna go and what things you could do to make it better. Um, or what things could happen that could really make it worse over time. And so, you know, I like sports and I think that's the good analogy to that. And I think I spent a ton of time looking at um, box scores from basketball games. And it, you can see sometimes if somebody shot four for 20 in a game, you're like, why did they shoot so much if they were just gonna shoot that bad? Or, um, you know, so it, it'll help help you understand the game a bit more a bit. So, to me, I think that where I think about where the future of finance is going, it's going to one where in the past, a lot of people who are in the industry also care and look at the numbers really well, but a lot of times they focused on like one metric, which I'll call the profitability of something and how much money can they make out of doing a business deal or some kind of transaction, where I think that we're seeing a change where that's not the only thing that's important. You don't want to just make money at the at the benefit for yourself, but at the detriment of somebody else. I think we're seeing now that there are other things that are important around social impact to care about. So hopefully 10 years from now, and I do believe that 10 years from now, we'll see people looking at numbers and tracking metrics that care about not lives touched, jobs created, impact, happiness, all these other things too. And I think that's such a positive outlook to have for the future to really not only understand the positive benefit for one party, but trying to understand the positive benefits for all the parties that are involved and, and to really try and maximize social impact as well. Uh, I, I do want to take another sort of step back and, and ask throughout your journey in finance, what is one of the biggest obstacles you faced in starting your journey in finance or during your journey in finance and investments in that sort of field? And how did you overcome that obstacle? Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, the big thing that I knew I wanted to do was be a businessman, um, but I didn't really know what that meant. And when I got to college, um, I remember taking accounting as my major because um, people told me, other people told me that accountants do business and that um, you also want a job that has good job security. So what I realized over time was that um, there's a poem um, by Robert Frost that basically talks about the road that's less traveled or not taken and that um, going the route that's usually not taken can make all the difference. And I found that to be true in my life that a lot of times you don't wanna be um, so laser focused on what other people may tell you or think for your life, but to um, figure out for yourself what career or journey you wanna take and then um, be able to embrace it and move forward with it. So to me, that's been the biggest lesson, which is to become who I am, be myself. And I think that's so inspirational, especially to a lot of young individuals out there, you know, who may be confused or really caught between a couple of different ideas that they have, or whether that's their career, or what they want to do in college, and giving that sort of inspiration to say, it's about what you really want to do, and not necessarily what others tell you to do. Is something I think that's going to positive, positively impact a, a lot of people. Awesome. And, and I'm personally very fortunate that my school has an entrepreneurship program 
uh, called Spark Incubator. And I owe lots of my personal growth to Spark. I do want to ask Chris, how do you think more high schools and colleges can facilitate an environment for community growth, innovation, and entrepreneurship? Yeah, I mean, Spark sounds amazing. And I don't recall having a program like Spark Incubator when I was in college. I mean, in high school, in high school, for sure. I don't think that existed. And I think that um, the culture of innovation and entrepreneurship um, can be cultivated with programs like what you have at Spark in, in Incubator. So I think that there should be more programming catered towards entrepreneurship um, and innovation generally. Um, and then the people who are creating these, the, these programs, they need to make it relatable to the people who are going to use it. So if it's high school students, make it as fun, make it as real, make it as cool for them as possible so that they can pique their interest and get exposed to it. Because I think expo I think in many cases, a lot of people um, only know what they know and that's all that they um, kind of focus on. And it's hard to really dream and, and, and try to make your vision a reality, but exposure to other people pursuing it and doing that, those things can get you inspired. So that would be my advice there. And hopefully, if you're um, going to expand or scale Spark, if you can, that would be a great step. And I do want to ask, Chris, what would your advice be for teens and youth? And how can we be social leaders and agents of change just like yourself? Yeah, I mean, I think that it goes back to my first statement about self-discovery. And um, to every teen and young person out there, and I say this to myself all the time, you got to remember that you're here for a reason. You have unique skills, talents, and gifts that the world is just waiting for you to share and show everybody. Um, so college was great for me because it gave me a chance to experiment. And, ex and recently, I've taken that same idea to my everyday life and try to experiment every single day, try to improve myself just a little bit every day. And if you can make every day count, um, and just think about, you know, um, what you want and how you can experiment to um, create the life and expose the gifts that you have, then that's the ultimate goal, in my opinion, for, for, the, for the next person. So just remember that you've got a lot of talent and then to try to make it a reality for other people to see. Chris, we thank you for your phenomenal leadership and your support of businesses in our distressed communities. And thank you so much for being here with us today and for answering all of our questions. Of course. Thanks for having me.